Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me loud and clear? All right. Um, so my name is Kyle Samani. I'm a co-founder and managing partner at Multicoin Capital. Today, I'm going to walk through some crypto mega theses. These are the three things that when we talk to investors looking at our fund, we kind of highlight to them as really the three uh, drivers of what we think are going to be the multi-trillion dollar opportunities for the crypto and the crypto ecosystem over the next decade or two. Uh, now, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about, about trust, because although we're going to talk about three themes, um, there's kind of an underlying current that, that goes under these three themes, and that is, is trust, or rather removing trust required to interact between different kinds of parties, whether that's for information or money or anything else. And if we think about society today, society is really built on trust, right? We trust banks, we trust technology companies, we trust insurance companies, government. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we have a beautiful building and all these people, right, this is all built on lots of layers of trust. What we're not going to talk about today is getting rid of all, all notions of trust, but recognizing just how interwoven trust is into a lot of the assumptions we take for granted, and then talking about how there's a lot of new opportunities if you get rid of some of those trust assumptions. So we're going to talk about three theses today. Um, we expect these to roughly play out over the next decade or two in approximate order and size. The first is what we broadly call open finance. If you follow crypto at all today, you might have heard the term DeFi. We use the term DeFi and open finance interchangeably. Uh, the second is Web3. Uh, and then the third is the opportunity for a global state free money. Uh, and so with that context, let's jump right into number one, the opportunity for open finance. So the key enabler that's going to make open finance possible is the modularization of financial primitives. And the result of that is going to be the commoditization of trust and dis disintermediation of middlemen. I know that's a lot of, of words, sounds almost like word salad. So let me kind of walk through what exactly that means, give a couple of examples, and talk about the, the ultimate value that can be produced from a system like this and how funds like ours can invest in these kinds of opportunities. Uh, so here are three different protocols that are today live on the Ethereum blockchain. You might have heard of some of them. Um, and what's cool about these is that each of these protocols is what we like to call a primitive that you can build on top of. Um, and so uh, the one of the bottom left there is, is 0x. And this allows any two people to trade assets without having a third party in the middle. Um, the second is called Maker, which is the ability to basically take your collateral, deposit it into a debt, uh, and then and withdraw a stable asset collateralized by the debt. Uh, and then the third is uh, Augur, which is a protocol for prediction markets. Um, so betting on sports games, politics, really, fut I mean, futures, anything. Um, and so what's cool about these primitives is that you can mix and match them together in different ways, and you can actually build higher level applications on top of them. So as a very simple example, um, the ZeroX protocol lets people trade assets, but it doesn't actually provide a way for there to be order books and price discovery. And so there's now companies like Diversify and Radar Relay that have built order books uh, on top of these off-chain, and they use the ZeroX protocol to settle on-chain. We've now seen a handful of companies start to build on top of the Augur protocol and the ZeroX protocol, and start building applications with even more functionality and logic that use ZeroX for trading and use Augur for resolving prediction markets. And then we've even started to see some of those teams incorporate Maker or the DAI, the DAI um, asset in the system um, as a trading pair for these kinds of things. And so what's super cool about this is that you can literally think of each of these um, protocols as a primitive. They're a Lego or a building block. And you can mix and match them to build a lot more advanced, higher order applications. If this at all sounds familiar, this is basically the same premise on which all of modern software is built. Uh, and this is kind of the foundation of the modern web. This is a very simple example. We have lots of things like JavaScript and Node and SMTP that power email applications. Right? So this is a very common paradigm we've already seen historically. So um, the, 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 as we think about the opportunities here, what's so powerful about this is that these protocols allow parties all over the world to engage in any notion of financial contract without counterparty risk. It's permissionless, meaning these things can happen on a global basis, um, and they're censorship resistant, and so no, no one can be stopped. And so when we think about these opportunities on a global basis, what we really like is this, al this allows new forms of cross-border commerce to come together that weren't really possible. Um, now, you might say, well, OK, like there's already lots of big institutions in, in the world who, like, they're not idiots. They see this stuff coming, and they're going to try and take advantage of it. Uh, how can you invest in startups and other kind of exciting new things? Um, case in point, JP Morgan and Fidelity are two large established companies that are like big on crypto, and they're going all in from different angles. JP Morgan is launching JPM coin, uh, and Fidelity is kind of pushing uh, crypto into its customer base. And one thing we've kind of noticed thinking historically is like when big companies see these mega trends coming, what happens? And actually, there's a lot of really funny examples if you look back at the internet in the 90s. This is a website. Most of you probably don't remember it. It's called pathfinder.com. 
Pathfinder.com was sponsored by Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner is the parent company that owns CNN, Time Magazine, uh, Sports Illustrated, a lot of major media properties. And in 1994, they had the uh, prescience to realize, hey, what if we took all of our media properties, put them together in a single news feed or a single website, and let people browse all of that on the internet, on a web page? And that's what Pathfinder.com was. Um, what's amazing is they had the vision right, and they executed basically everything incorrectly be between here and there. My, my point being is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities in, in crypto over the next decade or two where there's going to be opportunities for startups building open finance types of applications um, to take advantage of these things and build amazing new businesses. So that's kind of open finance and one major theme we're excited about. Uh, the second I'd like to highlight is Web3 and all of the really cool opportunities therein. So um, to understand what Web3 is, let's just, let's just consider how Web2 works. So this is uh, kind of how the modern Web2 data, data model works, where you're a consumer, you have a phone, and then you have all these applications you use. And each of those applications, the application provider also stores all of your data. Um, and you know, they can use that against you, they can abuse it, it can be hacked, there's all kinds of problems with it. The ultimate form of the Web3 vision is that you control and own your own data, and then you authorize applications to interact with it. Um, and so this is a very different kind of data model. Um, and this is what the hopefully Web3 vision is. Um, this, of course, sounds really nice. Oh, sorry. The kind of key thing enabling this is unbundling data ownership and application logic. Um, and hopefully the result will be self-sovereign data. So that's kind of how we hope this will come to, to, come to fruition. Um, the only problem with this vision, as I've kind of described it, is that there's really no practical reason why it should or shouldn't happen. We need to answer the question, you know, why and how will Web3 actually win? Um, this is a, a good question, right? We have all these incumbents. How are they actually going to be um, disrupted? And so um, the way we think about this is like, where are the next generation of entrepreneurs going to build? What are they going to, what platforms are they going to build on? And so we've seen kind of over time over the last decade or two, as these web two monopolies have grown and grown and grown, uh, and they establish more and more power, the relationship they have with the application developers, think Google and Facebook and the like, um, they, they're at their relationship with developers transitions from one of cooperation to one of competition. Um, and we've seen this time and time again. Microsoft has done this. Apple has done this. Google has done this. Uh, all of them really have, is that once they become cemented, they can choose to compete with their application developers. And this causes next generation developers to be scared to build on top of those platforms. Today, VCs will effectively not fund any business that relies wholly on, on Apple or Facebook as a, or Google as an example. Um, and so we have lots of precedent for this happening, right? This is Zynga stock price. You all remember Zynga. They made Farmville. Um, well, guess what happened at 15 bucks? Facebook announced a change to the newsfeed algorithm that deprioritized gaming, right? And they've never recovered ever since. Uh, but this doesn't just happen to big companies. It even happens to smaller entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like myself. My last startup, which was called Pristine, uh, we built software for Google Glass for surgeons. You all remember, right, remember Glass as a funny, silly thing that consumers ever used and looked pretty geeky, and it was that. But it was also a very handy tool for surgeons. Uh, we built the company to a few million in revenue, about 30 employees, and then Google killed Glass. Uh, which effectively ended my business overnight. So I learned what platform risk is in a re very real way, and I have since learned to not, to not build my next business on top of another platform. That is exactly how I learned about Ethereum and ultimately was drawn into the crypto ecosystem back in 2016. Um, so my point to you is that developers are starting to realize that the, these, you can't, it's, these kinds of e um, existential risks are not worth taking. If you're going to put years of your life into building something, you don't want to make sure that someone can pull the rug out from under you. So I'd like to highlight a couple of examples um, of things that, that of, biz, of teams and businesses that are building these new types of protocols. So one of our investments is a, a firm called Tari. Uh, they're building a protocol, um, and there's a, and it's focused on tickets, like for going to concerts and music venues and stuff. And they built an application on top of it called Big Neon. Uh, what's amazing is Big Neon is live today in about 10 cities in the U.S. They're processing millions of millions of tickets per year, uh, and they're rolling this thing out kind of um, all over all over the country. Uh, this is the kind of application where these guys would never build on Eventbrite or on top of Ticketmaster because they don't trust those underlying businesses. Um, so uh, I can't get into all of the other types of examples of things we invest in, but here's just some of the other kinds of infrastructure in Web3 of the kinds of things we're excited about that we invest in that we think will hopefully enable this kind of future to come to fruition. The Web3 vision is technically really ambitious, and there's still a lot of things that haven't been figured out, and those are the kinds of things um, we're investing in. Cool. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to talk about the opportunity for a global state-free money. Um, the opportunity here you guys are pretty familiar with is Bitcoin, and it's pretty easy to think about that. 
Um, as we all know, today we all trust our currencies. Um, we trust governments with the money supply, interest rates, these things. And a lot of people, pretty reasonably, uh, have good reason not to trust the governments. Um, there are more than 500 million people who live around the world who have very good reason not to trust their local governments. Um, and so the opportunity for, for crypto, right, is, is at a minimum to think of it as digital gold. The problem, naturally, with gold is that it's not divisible, hard to carry around, pretty obvious problems. Um, and so at a minimum, it makes sense that crypto can replace gold and this kind of uh, uh, state-free money application. Where we think the, the really interesting thing to think about is not just think about thinking about Bitcoin or crypto as digital gold, but as thinking about it as actually a much larger superset of digital gold. And there's kind of a few fundamental reasons why we believe that crypto can be an order of magnitude larger than, than gold is today. For a sense of reference, gold is about seven trillion, um, and we think that crypto can be a lot larger than that. So the first kind of opportunity is that crypto expands the market for gold. In the same way that um, Uber expanded the market for taxis, we think crypto will expand the market for gold. And then there's kind of a few reasons why that's the case. So the first is the people who most need access to gold or digital gold are the people who can't access it. If you live in any of these countries, you certainly don't want to carry physical gold on you, and you don't have access to buying securitized gold in a vault somewhere. These countries simply do not have the capital markets infrastructure to support that. And so the people who want to opt into, let's say, gold or some other state-free money literally cannot do so. This is exactly analogous to the way that people who wanted to take taxis couldn't because the taxi system was just so broken. And then Uber and Lyft and Grab and all these guys kind of address that problem. Um, the second reason we think crypto expands the opportunity for digital gold is it effectively enables you to have a Swiss bank account in your head. There are trillions of dollars of, of people holding wealth in offshore bank accounts, uh, and they do that because they do not want their capital to be known and accessible to the governments in which they, they live and reside, and they want a Swiss bank account. Crypto effectively provides that as a Swiss bank account in your head. Um, and so we can expect over time trillions of dollars of capital flows. The third, and this is really amazing, is that crypto provides an organic risk-free rate. A lot of investors, guys like Buffett and others, very publicly say gold is a useless investment because gold generates no yield. Well, the amazing thing about crypto systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, both proof-of-work and proof-of-stake systems, is that they can actually offer organic risk-free rates through the form of Lightning Network or through staking in these systems. Um, there's a ton of capital in the world that will not invest in assets that do not bear yield. Um, there's a lot of, for example, uh, big cap index funds and big cap pensions that will not invest in stocks that don't provide a dividend. Uh, and so this, this kind of uh, opportunity is just going to unlock new capital to enter this asset class that literally would not touch these types of assets otherwise. And then the last opportunity is, is we can expect over the next decade as these first two theses play out, a lot of new wealth is going to be unlocked and that wealth will largely be called call it crypto native wealth. And those people will choose to store their wealth um, in, in, these, in these crypto monies or these state free monies. And so when we add up all of these four opportunities, what really excites us is that we think that the market opportunity here can be on the order of $100 trillion. This can likely be one of the largest sources of wealth creation and wealth transfer in human history. And this is why we're so excited about crypto and why we, we are really all in. Uh, and so really to wrap things up, I just want to reiterate the value of, of trust and the opportunity for trust. Crypto is not about getting rid of all notions of trust in society, but there are a lot of unique ways in finance, in data ownership, and in the, in the definition of money itself that uh, crypto, we think, really can, can change how we think about trust and ultimately the impact uh, on how commerce is conducted. And those are the kinds of opportunities we're invested in. Trust is the foundation of the modern economy. Uh, but the greatest investment opportunity of our lifetime is betting that it doesn't necessarily have to be. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Kyle, we do, we do have a bit of time for questions, if you're OK to take a question. If we have some people in the audience, we do have a microphone if you have some questions for him. Uh, about how this is going to work. Uh, if you've got an idea in your head, I'm looking around the room, if anybody wants to put their hand up. I've got a question over here. Can we get a microphone to this man? There we go. He's on his way. Thanks. And if you could just say your name and uh, maybe where you're from, that'd be great, just to kick us off. Hi, um, Kyle Davies at Three Arrows Capital. Uh, thank you for the uh, overview, by the way. I've got a question for you. You mentioned um, platform risk. As a, as a key risk. How do you think about the opposite of that? The idea that someone's building on top and then they might fork the underlying protocol or not, the value accrual might not accrue to the underlying protocol that they're, that they're building on. Yeah, so I think those are two distinct questions. One is do people who build on top of a, of a platform try and fork it in crypto? And the second is value accrual. So let me address those, those separately. Um, 
So I, I think there's, a, in the early days of a platform, if let's say there's a single, a, a layer one and like an application on top that is the predominant application, um, there is a reasonable argument to make that the, the layer two team should fork the layer one and, and kind of become their own layer one and, and do that. Um, the problem is that, is that that becomes harder to do as there are more applications on the layer one. Um, this is probably most evident if you look at the Ethereum ecosystem today. Um, if you're, let's say, maker and you wanted to fork Ethereum for whatever reason, political, technical, doesn't really matter, the problem with doing that is that you would actually uh, destroy a lot of demand for DAI. Um, one of the big use cases, a lot of people hold DAI because they want to lend it on Compound, for example. So if you fork somewhere else where Compound does not, then you're now creating friction for your users and likely destroying demand for DAI. And so the fact that you have this global shared state is valuable and that creates, the fact that these things can talk and, and, and operate fluidly is what makes, it's, it's value created for both Maker and for Compound as one example. Um, in, in general, as, as we have more and more um, things built on top of these single pieces of state, those single pieces of state become more valuable and become harder to fork. Uh, for, for example, if you were to, you know, there's some people discussing today that Ethereum um, 1.0, uh, people, uh, there's a fork coming up in a couple months, changing the proof of work algorithm, and people are saying they're gonna fork uh, Ethereum when this happens. Uh, I, I assign a basically zero probability to the minority fork surviving because all of the economic activity happening on top of Ethereum uh, is gonna happen on one chain. If Augur forks or if Maker forks or if Compound forks, those teams are gonna effectively bless one chain, and I think they're very likely to all bless the same chain. Uh, and assuming they all are in, a lot in agreement with which chain they bless as the valid one, then the other chain will literally not work. The oracles won't work, the, the price systems won't work in those chains, and so uh, it's unlikely that those chains function in the event of a fork. So um, as these platforms get to some level of usage, I, I find fork risk to be uh, exceedingly low. Um, the second question was, was value accrual. Value accrual is a really hard problem in crypto. Um, most of the things we look at today that we consider investing in, that's really the hardest question we have to deal with is how does this thing accrue value? Uh, and in, in some cases, the answer is it cannot. Um, a very good example of this is, is the ZeroX protocol. Uh, we love the ZeroX protocol. We like the team. Uh, I highlighted them earlier in my, my presentation. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that the idea of having a, a, a piece of code or a library that trades assets between parties, that does not capture value and that the margins on that are, are, are already zero and that there's really not an intuitive way to capture value out of that. Uh, I wrote a blog post uh, a few months ago called On Value Capture at Layer 1 and Layer 2 that kind of dives into this and, and considers Layer 1 and Layer 2 separately. Um, in general, not all things can capture value in crypto. Um, my kind of one funny thing I've noticed in crypto is that in some ways crypto is the ultimate form of capitalism um, where margins go to zero, everything is open. And what's funny is that things kind of become socialist when you go so far capitalist. Um, and that is kind of an interesting um, trend we've noticed in a lot of the things we, we look at. Yeah, we got, got so two we'll come two down here. front first. Hi, Kyle. My name is Enrico Talin from Commercial Network, a big follower. Twitter follower, I'll always read your things. I would like to have uh, your opinion on uh, kind of like blockchain 3.0, kind of like the way that different blockchain will kind of in one, in one time interconnect with each other the same way the internet did when they had like the beginning only few blockchain, few networks and then open with TCP IP and became like a multi uh, network like interconnection network. So, what is basically your opinion on the probably next generation of blockchain, like with things like Cosmos, Polkadot, that will in an IBC like in interconnection uh, protocols, so they will be able to interconnect with each other. What is your opinion on that? Yeah. So, um, the, the question, just for everyone, to make sure you hear, is, is you know, there's a lot of talk of interoperating blockchains. A lot of teams like Cosmos and Polkadot are, are working on trying to solve these problems. So kind of what, what's my opinion on them? Um, so we've spent a lot of time on, on this particular question. Uh, we do not own Cosmos or Polkadot at Multicoin, um, but we, we know the teams very well and have spent quite a bit of time on it. Um, so one thing I find that that's people like to use as an analogy is the idea of networks. The internet is, as the name suggests, a connection of, is a network of networks. And as people look at crypto, they often think, okay, well, we can't scale these blockchains, so we're going to have a lot of blockchains, and they're going to talk to each other, and we're going to have blockchains of blockchains and networks of blockchains and this kind of a thing. And so there's kind of a natural reason to, to draw that analogy and think that way. Um, I, I don't think that analogy is correct. 
um, for the simple reason that blockchains are global rep state machines, um, and the internet is by definition a stateless protocol. And so I, I struggle to compare stateless and stateful protocols kind of by, by, by definition. They're just very different sets of constraints and trade-offs that you have to make in stateful and stateless things. Um, I am probably much less optimistic on, not that interoperability won't happen, but that interoperability will be meaningfully useful than I think most of my peers are. Um, it creates a lot of mechanical, what I like to call mechanical complexity of these different systems talking to each other. Um, it creates a lot of weird new security problems in the systems um, in that security is not accruing to a single place and so the systems become more fragile. Um, and it's also not clear that a lot of the use cases as they're intended to be used um, can be done asynchronously um, in terms of, of contract calls and things kind of moving back and forth. And so um, I, am, I am generally of the opinion that the interoperability stuff, while it will happen and it will work, uh, I think it's ultimately going to be less impactful than most people would like. Um, if you can scale a layer one and make it work, which I think is possible, then I think we'll have a lot of new opportunities that just simply uh, diminish the value of interoperability um, in kind of new and novel ways. Um, I expect that as m more and more blockchains come out, and we're seeing this happen now, things like Terra, uh, things like the Binance chain, there's a lot of Cosmos SDK chains. I expect some of these chains are going to be attacked and it's going to scare people away from small chains that require interoperability and uh, people will gravitate back towards kind of master chains. Um, this is a, a fun historical reference point. Um, if you go back and, and listen to Vitalik's original keynote in January 2014 when he announced Ethereum, uh, it's about a 20 minute talk. I, I like to listen to it every now and again, just kind of remind myself how to think about these things from first principles because uh, Vitalik does a great job, is that the kind of the reason he made Ethereum was that he looked at Bitcoin and Bit people were, had these ideas about, well, we can make a name coin and we can make this other smart contract coin and we can make a derivatives coin and whatever. And each of these teams faced the same problem of consensus and proof of work and the VM and all these things. And he realized, hey, can we, can we abstract all this complexity, provide a single chain, a single execution layer and programmable code and kind of abstract all this complexity and like the defining reason for Ethereum to exist is to provide security and other, other, other benefits. Um, I think what we've kind of seen happen over the last four or five years is Ethereum created all these amazing new ideas and, and spurred all this new innovation. Uh, and then people kind of realized they were hitting kind of fundamental constraints in the, the uh, they hit the constraints of Ethereum and, and proof of work. Um, and so they've struggled and they've kind of gone back to fragmented siloed systems and kind of forgotten the original point of why Ethereum was, was such a breakthrough. So I, th I think we will slowly see a reversion there, but that's likely to be a, a multi-year multi -year thing. There was another question over here. Yeah, we got a microphone coming. Thanks for the presentation, Carl. My name is George from uh, Bitspark. Uh, quick question, so this is Invest Asia. Um, a lot of the references in your presentation were related to the USA, so they're not really that relevant here, to be honest. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the projects of which you're looking at in this region, whereby outside we have an exchange which is responsible for over half of every spot trade that is executed on any spot exchange. We have more OTC brokers in one city than in all of the United States in some places here. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, liquidity that is happening, retail investment here. Uh, what, and I note some of the decentralized projects which you mentioned as well, which is fair enough. I mean, they're not really based anywhere, so probably, uh, you know, can be, can be talking about it in any platform. But is there any, I guess, projects that you're looking at in this side of the world which really catch your eye at Multicoin? And, uh, yeah, if so, what? Um, yes, yeah, so the question was, you know, there's a ton of happening here. Exchanges here, miners are here, OTC desks are here. This, this presentation was very admittedly pretty Western biased. Um, so what, what are we seeing here and what are we looking at? Um, so Multicoin has made, since inception, 22 or 23 private market investments in addition to our public market portfolio. Um, of those 22 or 23, two of them are based in Asia. Uh, one is Nervos, they're based in mainland China, and the one is Taurus, which is based here in Singapore. So about 10% of our portfolio is based here. Um, so we are looking at deals here. We've looked at a lot of deals here. Uh, in general, just given our US presence, it's, it's, we have a higher bar of getting comfortable. It's just harder. So that's certainly part of the reason. Um, we're actually trying to hire someone here in Singapore right now. And we recognize there's a ton of opportunity here. 
Um, and so we're trying to figure that out, but it's a slow and challenging process. Um, in general, what I love about the opportunities in Asia is that people here need it so much. They need crypto so much more than they need it in the West. Um, in the US, people, have, they're very happy with the, the banking system for the, for the most part. The financial rails they're happy with. There aren't capital controls. Same is true for Western Europe broadly. Uh, the people who need crypto are like the, three, the $4 billion worth of people holding Tether, right? Like those are the people by definition who like need crypto because they don't want to, to deal with fiat systems. So I, I, think, I think one of the kind of fundamental disconnects we're seeing in crypto now is that a, I'd say a lot of the development activity uh, uh, is in the, in the US and a lot of the, the customers and users of these systems, especially for things like open finance, uh, are, are in Asia. And then the communication barrier, the language barrier, the just distance, um, cultural barrier is, is tough to overcome. Uh, we're starting to see that kind of get bridged slowly, but it's happening, I think, slower than, than I would have expected. Um, and, and so there's a lot of people, I think, working to make that happen, but it's just a, it's a slow, slow transition. Um, the other thing I really like about Asia is just the willingness to embrace and try new things. Um, looking at stuff like Terra, for example, in Korea, uh, I think is really exciting. Or looking at what Clayton and Line are doing in the messaging apps in Korea and Japan. Um, these companies seem to be much more willing to experiment and move fast. Um, and so that, that's really exciting. Uh, unclear if they're going to actually make anything work, but there's a lot of cool levers being played with. We are examining all of the above. We've spoken to most of these teams. Um, and we're trying to figure it out and, and place bets where, where we can. But we are very excited about the opportunity here. This is my second time in Asia this year. I'll probably be back a third time. Uh, we know there's a ton of opportunity. We've got time for maybe one more question, I think, if we've got another hand up. No, we're good? All right, George, the last question was to you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's have a big thank you to our man, Kyle Samani. He's come all the way from Austin, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Great Andrew. presentation. Look forward to hearing more about this fund. Awesome.